It's time for This Week in Science and Education, the Internet show that talks about all things health research and science related, new discoveries, new cures. How do we take this information and how do we make it relevant for the teachers and students in today's classroom? We're going to find out next. Stay tuned for This Week in Science and Education. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning. At Sheridan, students shine brighter. Visit their website at SheridanShineBrighter.com. It's time for This Week in Science and Education. This is episode 37, recorded Tuesday, April the 26, 2011. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to join us on today's show. Very special guest, Dr. Jeremy Friedberg from Sponge Lab in Toronto, is going to talk to us about educational science games. But before we get to him, I want to welcome back to the show our traveler, the guy we sent to Scotland uh, on assignment, I think, uh, <laughs> Thomas Merritt from Laurentian University. Hey, Thomas, how was Scotland? Scotland was, was uh, very nice. You'll get the, uh, the expense charges in the next couple of days. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. We know exactly what to do with those because I get them from Colin Jago every once in a while. Uh, how does that work mm -hmm. for you, Colin? Uh, yeah, I'm still waiting for that first check, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Must have got lost in the mail. Sorry. I guess so. Colin Thomas, Jago, you're out of luck, my friend. The <laughs> district school board. <laughs> What's going on <laughs> in Peterborough, Colin? Uh, it's springtime, so it's raining and muddy. What are you, you going to do? I know. What, what was the weather like in Scotland? Uh, the best, yeah, that's the best you, weather they'd had in years. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the best weather they'd had in years. It was uh, 17 nice. and sunny the entire time. It was Beautiful. completely unreasonable. I came home and, and we've still got ice in the lake. I'm, I'm absolutely yeah. going insane. <laughs> that doesn't sound fair. <laughs> Anyways, I was in good Diego to have you the, back. The week before that. Oh, Thank yeah, you. That's right. <laughs> Well, we missed you. We had some interesting and some great uh, hosts that uh, kind of stepped in, you know. But uh, you know, while you were gone, we really thank them for for doing that. But uh, always nice to have you back. All right, let's get to our guest. I'll provide an introduction. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Friedberg is a PhD. He's um, one of the co-founders of Sponge Lab, uh, out of Toronto, Ontario, with a doctorate in molecular genetics and biotechnology from the University of Guelph. Dr. Friedberg has been extensively involved in both public and private scientific education outreach programs, teaching all about the aspects of biology. He has consulted, designed, and developed interactive education assets for audiences from textbooks to museum-style exhibits. Dr. Friedberg has been teaching for over 10 years and has taught at a number of Ontario universities, including University of Western Ontario, University of Guelph, Wilfrid Laurier, University of Waterloo, and the University of Toronto. Very excited to have you on the show today, Dr. Freebird. Thanks for taking the time to join us. It's my pleasure. It's great to be here. Let's start by uh, having you tell us a little bit about what Sponge Lab is and uh, what do you do there? Well, uh, Sponge Lab. Well, we're, we, we call ourselves an educational gaming company. Um, and, well, we produce computer games to teach and yes I have a, a, a background in science and clearly you can see how that leads into game production it's a bit of an odd, uh, odd transition in careers I never imagined that I would actually be doing this but ultimately what we do at Sponge Lab came out of need from what I used to what, what I used to do in my teaching so um, Taking a step, how this all started is taking a step back to graduate school. And um, when you're a graduate student at, at a university, you you do a lot of teaching. And often it's the way you sort of pay for your graduate education. You do a lot of teaching. And I will never forget my first time teaching a genetics class to second year students at the University of Guelph. And I got up awkward and nervous, and I was horrible, absolutely terrible. <laughs> and um, part of part of my my exploration, figuring out why I was so horrible, was going back to why I never understood certain things in in genetics when I was taking it. And I'll never forget my professor, and after our first midterm exam came in, slapped down a stack of papers and said, clearly, you've studied this for four years and you still have no clue how it works. <laughs> and so um, I was teaching mitosis, cell division to my students. And it was, you know, you, you learn about this in high school and you keep going back. And uh, I got a tip 
from uh, one of my professors at the University of Western Ontario, actually. It was, it was a, a guy named Tom Haffey, who was a, a phenomenal teacher. And he's like, you know what, why don't you try using some plasticine? And I started making chromosomes with my students. And from there, it sort of blossomed in, well, let's try to make some animations. Oh, that's great. Um, you sort of lost the tactile aspect of understanding, but what I really wanted to do was create environments to take my students inside of the biology. And so I started to experiment with computer gaming engines as a way to recreate the biology that I wanted to teach and study. And from there, it just started to evolve into, an, into a particular approach. And that approach comes out of game-based learning theory, which has some pretty powerful stuff in it. So... Are you one of those kids that was down in the basement playing video games? For like, How did this uh, idea come about, and why was it so natural for you to incorporate gaming as a learning tool? Uh, I was um, of the early Nintendo generation. I, I remember when I was, yeah. I think it was 12, it was an actual clinical uh, By the way. disorder <laughs> called Nintendo's Thumb. I remember this. But uh, yeah. it, was, it was quite affirmed that I, there was no such thing as a career in, in, in video games at all. Uh, but yeah, it was of the gaming generation. And you know, it, it sort of, it, it played to me very well um, as I went through education. I think um, going through high school and university, I struggled through the whole thing. And it sort of didn't figure out until I was in about third year that I... I learn by pictures. I'm a complete visual learner. And I think if I had gone through the education system today, I probably would have been labeled with some kind of a learning disorder, a learning challenge. And uh, it was that complete immersive experience, that all that full, true multimedia experience was, was effective for me. And I learned how to adapt my learning approach to succeed in university. Um, but when I started to actually research building games to teach, it turns out there's a, there's some really powerful things that come out of it. And sort of the education community at large has, has sort of really shifted its focus into what type of minds are we, do we need to create to fuel our, our, our society? And it's looking at basic things like creativity and critical thinking. And that's on the books. And go ahead, go teach it. There you go. <laughs> teach your kids to be creative. And like, everyone sort of sits back and like, well, all right, well, how do we, how do, how do, we do that? I mean, creativity, um, and I would argue creativity is something that cannot be taught, and it's, it, it's, it's a very complex characteristic. It's inherent in all of us, but as educators, we have to, it's our responsibility to help encourage it, and when it occurs, to help, help foster it. And so all we can do is create the environments to allow creativity to occur. And, and the other problem is how do you assess creativity? It's completely subjective. I mean, I, I'll walk into an art gallery and see a, you know, a 12 foot high canvas, completely white with a red dot in the bottom right corner. And I, I throw up my hands, but other people will say, that's brilliant. That's absolutely amazing. And so this, this element of this is like, how do you even assess something that's so completely subjective? But when it comes to game-based learning, there's it, some really powerful things that have happened in the communities. And it's, it's really happened in very specific environments, and we're trying to bring it into mainstream education. A great example. Um, you were just on a flight back from, from Scotland? Yeah, yeah. You're sitting in the back of the plane. What's one character? If you had to choose the most important characteristic you would want that pilot to have, what do you think it would be? Uh, well, I, I hope he's not drinking. <laughs> um, Staying away. So, uh, re reliability, I guess? Reliability? Is that That's not good. the answer you're looking for? <laughs> well, it's important. What, what I, good eyesight. What I, <laughs> good eyesight, yes. And uh, uh, what, I, what I became interested in, in and what people who are training pilots became interested in, the idea is when you're up at 32,000 feet and something goes wrong, can you be creative about a solution? Can you think critically in, that, in, in three minutes and get it done to get out, of, get out of that situation alive? So the question became is, can you teach that? Can you assess that? And so training pilots started to employ this idea of a simulator. You spent time in the classroom. You learned all the bits and pieces, all the protocols and procedures, but then we're going to put you in a simulator. Not once, twice, but for hundreds of hours. And most of the time, it's business as usual. You take off, you land, but when you're not expecting it, that's when a hydraulic uh, failure occurs or an electrical fire or a combination of events you could never have imagined. And the evaluators are looking at, well, how did you perform in that instance? And then how do you perform over a long period of time? And through that process, you're both teaching and assessing at the same time, but you get this temporal understanding of how this, this mind is working within this scenario. And you get a, a real understanding of, is this a creative, critical thinking mind?
And that type of approach, which started in the 60s to train pilots, is filtered into just about every aspect of military training, and, you know, sub crews, battleship crews, ground troops, and even into how we're training physicians and doctors. There's a, a really amazing game project called Pulse, originally started by the U.S. Naval Academy. It's actually run out of Texas A&M right now, but it's a full multiplayer virtual hospital to deal with the concept of trauma. You know, patient comes in, and the, whole, the process from at the front door of, the, of, that, of that structure, the building carrying them all the way into, into surgery and it, the results are, f are phenomenal. It's a powerful, powerful way to teach. The, the advantage is, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just, um, as, as you're saying this, I wonder if you could give us an example, taking us back. Um, you know, you, you gave the example of teaching mitosis, so in, in genetics, I, I, I teach genetics too. Um, can you give us an example of how you use this kind of game-based approach in, in genetics? So. Uh, I, I can understand how a simulator would work, you know, if you're trying to train, train a, a pilot or a surgeon or a soldier. But it, it, how are you taking, how are you using this to get the creativity and this idea of game-based learning into something as, as sort of content-driven as genetics or mitosis? There's there's a couple of things. Um, so. The, what the, what, where I was sort of leading to is when you're building to, uh, an environment to train like a pilot or physician, there it is. You create that whole structure over there and you can immerse that learner in that environment. When we're building things for school, like high school and university, we now have to adapt to the place that we are. And that's an enormous challenge. Um, so when it comes to building games um, for the classroom, one of the most important things we do is we tell stories. And that's the first thing that get that hooks, um, that hooks a user. So... Um, we released a game this past September on the history of, it's called the History of Biology. It's horribly named, we're terrible at marketing at Sponge Lab, but uh, it, the game was an experiment as well as a tool to teach history because um, by and large, history is completely glossed over in every class that tries to teach biology, but it is, it's the foundation for understanding why things went the way they did and the choices they made. So in that game, there's a lot of genetics. So content-wise, the game deals with the people, their discoveries, the tools and techniques. So um, genetic techniques, like from beginning at, at Mendelian genetics all the way up to, you know, how to use modern databases. And the question is, how did we hook a user into this and get them to actually use these tools. So we wrote a story, a rich story, about this character named Walden Shire, who was, you've taken a job for this professor who's vanished the night he's supposed to receive his second Nobel Prize. And, you know, you show up for the first day in the job in the game and you receive this envelope with four objects in it. And these objects lead you on a web scavenger hunt. So you're given a mission in the game, and then you have to go out and do your own research to solve the mission. So as an example, this, one of the objects is a gold coin. And through your mission, you find out this gold coin links to a guy named Zacharias Jansen. Anybody remember who Jansen was? Let's go to no. the geneticist of the crowd. <laughs> Jan all right, well, all right, I'll save you the suspense here. Jansen was cr is one of the people credited with developing the first microscopes. But through our game, they find out that Jansen was originally a telescope maker who switched to making microscopes. He was a rare coin collector, and he also used to make coins. He just made a lot of coins that looked like regular coins and landed himself on trial for seven years and eventually uh, convicted of counterfeiting. He was given the death sentence for counterfeiting, and he was able to skirt the gallows because everyone in the courtroom was on his payroll. So here is one of these monoliths of science who is ultimately a regular flawed person like, like, the, like all the rest of us. Not that I'm condoning counterfeiting or anything like that, but it, it, it starts to introduce the connection of when did the people start using microscopes and also ask the question of, well, why might he have been counterfeiting? Perhaps the microscope business wasn't so great in 1618. I mean, who knows? But the, the point is the game allows us, the, the story allows us to connect meaning and topical content to the science itself. So within our game, as users go out and experience things on the Internet, they're interacting with real websites, fake websites that we've planted, and real websites that have planted information in it. So if you go to the eyeball database, one of the online genetic databases, uh, you'll find a, a, an organism that doesn't belong in the database, and, and it's, there's information from our, that pertaining to our game. But we, through that, we deal with other things. So when we get to Mendelian genetics, how do we introduce Mendelian genetics in the game? Well, at one stop in the game, you end up visiting Mendel's blog. Yes, of course, Mendel's blogging from beyond, and he's, of course, blogging in Latin. And as you translate his Latin blog entries, it's how we sort of introduce them in the, his, his experiments that he did, but also wrestling with the ethical issues that we know he fudged his data. 
and mm -hmm. why might hip fudge this data? So through, you know, Mendel was doing, working on genetics in a time when there, we didn't know about DNA, and he didn't know about chromosomes or any of the things that we know that would skew the numbers. And so um, it opens the door to the conversation of, well, what is the analysis that was done? Why are the numbers skewed? So introducing other genetic mechanisms into, into the story. So it's the story itself and the people and the richness of, of who they were and the context of their political, social, and cultural worlds that they were in at the time that really, um, that really brings meaning and, and engagement to the, to the content. Jeremy, can I pull that, up his really blog here on your website? Pardon me? Can I pull up uh, Mendel's blog here on your website? Yeah, you, the, the, it's actually a public site. I think if you go to uh, www.mendelsgarden.com, you'll, you'll pull up okay. the blog. Uh, you, won't be able to, you won't be able to translate the pages. You have to be logged into the game to do that. Um, the game is actually okay. quite interesting because, like most games that come out, most commercial games, somebody posts up a walkthrough of it and goes up online. It's, there's spoilers all over the place. We can't afford that right. because it's an educational game. So as you play our game, all the content is dynamically and continuously randomized. So hmm. no one person, there's no, no, you can't post the walkthrough. You can sort of work together to sort of figure out what you need to do in and around a mission, but everyone has to go after their own data. And so it's hmm. not even like the data is tied to a specific user account. It's randomly generated at the moment the mission is initiated. So, okay. Sorry, Thomas, I think I jumped on it, you. You had a follow-up question? You know, it, uh, well, more of a, a comment. I mean, this idea of, of, of history. Um, genetics, probably more than any other course I've taught, they, there usually is the, the first chapter of a genetics textbook where they, they give you a history of genetics, right? And, and they give you a little bit of Mendelian genetics. They, uh, they do a walkthrough on, on early chemical analysis of the cell. With you know, We found proteins. We found DNA. Um, and the, the one thing that I try to use that when I work with, with new students is to, to point out the mistakes that have been made along the way. And, and you know, the, too often when we teach, we teach straight out of a textbook. You've got a limited amount of time. You've got a certain amount of material you have to get through. And I think that, that we're realizing that, that we've, for the past some period of time, we've been too heavily focused on getting this entire list of facts out instead of teaching students how to learn from the facts that are at hand. Um, and the, the, the DNA protein story is, is a pretty good one to, to do with that, because if, if you look at the content of the cell, there's more protein and it's more diverse chemically than DNA, where you've got less DNA and chemically it's very uniform. And so when we were trying to determine what the informational molecule in the cell was, early indications were that it should be protein because there was a greater diversity there. It more closely mimicked our own alphabet and there was more of it. And we were wrong. And it wasn't because the, the, these weren't bright people. It was just with the information that they had, they were drawing the, the wrong conclusions. And I think that one of the things that we can really try to get across to teachers is getting that process to, to the students and you know pointing out where scientists have been wrong in the past with the idea that we're not trying to tell the students that what we're going to tell them right now is correct, because it's not. Everything in our textbooks is almost certainly wrong. It's incomplete. We're doing the best that we can at the moment. But if you look at a textbook in five years, it's going to be different from what I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah. And students aren't dumb. And if you try to tell them that this is right, and they know it's not, they're not going to listen to you. But if you say, look, this is our best guess with the information that we have at hand, and we know it's going to change through time, then you've got a better chance of en engaging the students. And so I think this idea of, a, of an historical perspective is a really good one. Um, and then the idea of, of neat stories. I mean, it's always great to put a story in that, that brings people back. I mean, the, the, your microscope guy, um, that's a fantastic way to, to bring people, to engage them, to get this, the students uh, paying attention to the details. That's really well done. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you're, you're, I think you're absolutely right, and I, I think through this idea of story, you can start to do a variety of different things. So some things we have to teach our students is the concepts of um, introns, exons, and central dogma of genetics. You know, the, there's DNA, RNA, and proteins, and the, the flow of information. So uh, we wrestled with this, and my team has wrestled with it. How do we, what do we build to teach this? And so this, we wove it into the history game in a way that, well, you wait students to GenBank and they have to get three different sequences out from different sources. They string them together on their own and then they have to use GenBank tools to translate them and then we've wrote, written messages in the protein code that actually further the gameplay. So we're using a, a real online 
how to use a database, searching information, how to apply these sort of digital tools in, in genetic research, but it's there to actually drive the gameplay. So there's two motivations that are built into it. And so we keep using different devices like that throughout the game, and we found just from our, our, the user using it, it's, it's actually really engaging. And so there are actual experiments that they're running throughout the game. I don't want to spoil it for, for the entire audience, but <laughs> what you're working up to is the, you know, the professor you'd work for has disappeared to finish some earth-shattering work. I'm not going to spoil it, but you have essentially have to complete the last experiment on your own, and all the tools you have are building up to it. So, you know, one mission, you actually have to use a microscope to look at something that's microscopic, and you have, you find, you find this busted up old um, compound microscope that you have to reassemble before you can actually use it. So, you know, it's a direct curriculum item for high school students is the parts of a microscope. What do they do? How to put them together? But there's then the need to put it together, to use it, to actually do something. And so, yeah, we do this and we weave it together with all the stories and that's the real, the, the really fabulous stuff. And I mean, even like the stories in and around Watson and Crick, I mean, everybody, pretty much in the world, thinks that Watson and Crick did all the work around the discovery of DNA. And it was... People like Rosalind Franklin, who did the lion's share of the work, who never got the credit until after she was, she was dead, solely because she had to be a woman in the 50s. And so there's these really interesting stories, these characters, these people, and that really is what makes it um, have some kind of meaning and, and context for the students. Very much like a great movie. We get attached to the characters. We want to know who they were, where they were, and what, were the, what was the world like that they were, they were working in, and that, how that shaped who they are and what they did. Jeremy, you must have some of the best staff meetings ever over there. I mean, how much fun can it be to sit around the table and think up different, you know, components that go into some of your work? I think that must be absolutely fascinating. We have, we have, a, we have fun. There's a, the, one of the games, uh, we, it's a free download from our website. It's called Transcription Hero, which is a ripoff, no, sorry, an homage to Guitar Hero. But <laughs> you're, the goal of the game was we want, it's the teaching process of transcription, but you're the enzyme. You're trying to do it faster and better than the real enzyme. So you're transcribing DNA, but we figured, you know, we better hook this up to a, uh, um, a Guitar Hero controller. So um, the game itself, you connect your Guitar Hero controller. It plays whatever local music you have on your computer. So you're rocking out, transcribing DNA, trying to do it faster and better than the real uh, enzyme. And the mistakes you make get translated into mutations into the sequence. So it's a fun game, and yes, we, have a, we, we, we enjoy what we do. Hey, Colin, what about this idea? You know, I, I find it fascinating, you know, just to talk to Jeremy and listen about different ways that people learn, you know, and learning through, uh, through gaming and mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, what do you guys uh, do over there at Kawartha surrounding that? Do you take all of these different um, styles <laughs> or different methods that people use into account? Or, you know, give it's us games every day, Kevin. That's all we do. It's just games <laughs> all the time. Every, you know, that's oh, that's I'm exactly totally coming there for school. <laughs> Absolutely. That's the only way we can get enrollment now with the way things are going. Um, no, I, you know what? <laughs> these things, it's, it's very interesting listening to you, to you talk, Jeremy. Just the, the whole concept of, of, of game-based learning just it fascinates me. And I mean, it feeds into so many different ways that people learn and so many different theories of learning and, and, and how we actually get to a deep understanding of something. And we've talked about it on this show a number of times, uh, various ways of doing that. The question sort of occurred to me because it was very interesting, just the idea of, of game-based learning theory. Can you maybe just give us a little bit of kind of the, 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 the theory of learning background? In, we talk about the fun the kids are having and they're so engaged by it, and, but the, the, the transference then of the learning sort of to long-term understanding, and I know game-based theory sort of comes at that a little bit. Can you maybe talk about, about how that plays into your games? Uh, I, absolutely. Uh, game theory has been around for a long time, and it really, if you look at the elements of what is in a game, and mm -hmm. it goes back to the dawn of human civilization. I mean, take chess as an example. It's a 6,000-year-old game, but it, is orig it was originally designed to teach military strategy. But the mm -hmm. idea of working together with an objective and, ch and, and specific challenges is the, the essence of a game. A game is an interactive simulation with objectives and challenges. And in many educational circles, I'm not allowed to even talk about the word game, but and that's how I'll yeah. describe it. But, you know, if you are you know, playing chess or learning to play soccer, for example... The, the model is the same, and how you excel in that environment is the same as well. And to excel in chess or excel in soccer, it's about creativity and critical thinking and learning right. to interact with that environment, and, and that's really what it is. And that keeps feeding in, into modern days. So this, these are things that have evolved with us from the beginning. And even if you, you know, 
if you take a look at some of the basic biology, I mean, all of us are born into this bright, noisy, vivid world. We are designed to interact with a three-dimensional space, and our brains suck everything in and distill it down. So we're sitting in here, and the noises, the sounds, the smells, is all part of that learning experience. Yet it seems when in formal education, we consider that a distraction, and we, we, mm. we should be pushing it away and focusing on an on a very specific way to acquire information. And so game, you know, from its very roots and from the very beginning, has, is designed the way we work and designed to bring people together and work and sort of work through this, these ideas. But that idea of um, objectives and challenges succeeds when there is motivation and there's reward. And there is um, the whole circle of, of people talking now about the concept of the gamification of education. And what this is really talking about is looking at games in whatever forms you find, from chess to, you know, Halo, what motivates that player to keep using this immersive environment? Getting up on the leaderboard, getting points, and have we missed the mark in education? Have we not really found the true motivator yet? I'm not saying we, I don't really know yet, but it's something we're, we're experimenting with. And even if you go outside of education, if you look at sort of our society as whole, gamification has shown some pretty powerful things. And so mm. education is about changing behavior. We're trying to take a mind and getting it to think and think in a different way, behave in a different way. And all of us are subject to that. And a great example of that is air miles. Who, anyone carry an air miles card? I, I do. I've been carrying it since 92. I've been racking up points. I've never redeemed a single one of them. Why do I do this? <laughs> you know, it's unbelievable that I actually participate in this, ha this, this behavior of, I'll go to the grocery store, and, you know, I went in to buy a, you know, a bag of coffee and a loaf of bread, but they're going to give me 10 more points to buy a second loaf of bread. That's probably going to go bad. But you know what? I think I'm going to eat at the store, and I'll buy it. They've effectively they found, a, found yeah. a mechanism to change my behavior, and apparently my motivation is a couple of points. That it barely doesn't mean much, but, but ultimately somewhere in the back of my psyche is I'm thinking, you know what? If I get enough points in 25 years, I might be able to get that espresso machine that I've always wanted. So there's something really bizarre about that. And, you know, you look at a program like Air Miles, and there, there are 10 million subscribers across Canada. It's in two-thirds of Canadian households. There's something to that psychology that all wraps up into game theory about what it is that a, a user, a learner, needs to be motivated to change that behavior. And so the idea of gamification, if, well, if we can get people to buy loaves of bread with points, perhaps we can get people to, you know, brush their teeth twice a day if we gave them points. Or maybe this is the way we can start to get people to vote in an election, which is very <laughs> topical right now. Or perhaps, yeah. you know, this is a way to deal with this thing of healthy eating. And we're actually working on a virtual world right now that deals with the concept of lifestyle choice and overall health. Because we've been struggling with this as a community for a long time, but you know, I really can't fathom in any any meaningful way the burger and fries I'm going to have for lunch today is going to have some measurable impact on my health in 30 years. And so, these ideas of of creativity, critical critical thinking, reward, and motivation get strung together in some very meaningful ways. And this is what we, as as a business at SpongeBob, are experimenting with in developing products to do. You know, the one guy you don't want on that point team is Drew Carey. Remember that show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? He just gives away points like it's rain, you know, like a million points for you, 10,000 points for you. You know, that's a guy you don't want working at Air Miles. Anyways, uh, Thomas, last question to you, and then we've got to go to break. Okay, uh, well, so let me just sort of play devil's advocate. I, I completely buy into the idea that, that having this game-based approach is, is going to get students more interested in learning the material that, that we've got in front of them. Um, our job as an educator is to get that material to the student and then do it in such a way that they can actually use that and use the skills that they've developed while they were learning. Whether they're ever going to use that particular material, it's the skills that they've developed in that class. If we, de if we have now, or we're in the process of creating students that will only learn in this sort of game-based environment, I mean, we're, again, devil's advocate, we're sort of pandering to the student, and they move into the job market, are they going to be able to, to you know, what are they going to do in a job market that's not game-based, where they're not accumulating points, or, or do, do we have evidence that the skills that they're learning in this game-based learning system do actually carry over into the job market? Come to uh, B-Rock. We play games all day long. 
I, 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 your, point is, your point is quite valid, and I am by no means a proponent that we should uh, plug every student in 24 hours a day. There is a place for this in what we do. If you're going to learn about forest ecology, by all means, go to the forest. You know, when you're learning about culturing bacteria, you know, actually run the wet lab. But there's a way to sew it all together. But ultimately, what we're interested in is concept of being able to explore creativity and critical thinking. And to be able to, the only way you'll become good at this is through practice. I think that's really the point. And these environments allow those characteristics to, to culture and flourish. And that, in my mind, is what you need to get out in the real world. Like, you, yes, you need information at your fingertips. You need to have that raw material as a, as a reference source to get at. But if you can take any situation, you can think critically and be creative. It doesn't matter where you go and what you do, you're going to be a, you're going to be a success. And I think that's what the, the, the world outside of education is really demanding of students. In, in, and I see it in my, in my, in my employees, is you've got to come into a situation, you've got to quickly assess what's going on and figure out how to, how to, how to work in it. And it, it's, it's not just a, a fixed job. You're doing all kinds of different things and learning things that you never have done before. And that ultimately will flourish if you can think critically and be creative. And that's, that, I think that's what simulation, simulated environments has the ability to do is, is to help culture and, and, and grow your skills at, at creativity and critical thinking. Good stuff. We're talking with uh, Dr. Jeremy Friedberg from Sponge Lab uh, in Toronto, Ontario. Um, I do want to take a minute for a little break to so mention our sponsor. When we come back, we'll uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the actual uh, software that they're developing over at Sponge Labs. And maybe, uh, Jeremy, you could take us through a couple of maybe your favorites, uh, and, and we can explore those. But before we get to that... I do want to mention our good friends at Mueller Systems in uh, Woodstock, Ontario, Canada. They're the makers of back backup software. Uh, and whether you're the uh, the next Jeremy Freeberg out there, uh, you know, developing software and games to help kids learn, or maybe you're just, uh, you know, Kevin Kugler who's uh, just trying to make a small bit of difference, you still are going to have data that you need to back up and keep safe. And uh, if you just do it on your hard drive and just use CD-ROMs and uh, external media, that's great, but, man, wouldn't it be great to also have some in the cloud? And that's what our good friends at Mueller Systems do. So we encourage you to check out their website, which is MuellerData.com, M-U-L-L-E-R-D-A-T-A.com slash VROC, V-R-O-C. Make sure you put in that VROC so we get credit for your hits. We appreciate you doing that. And thanks very much to our sponsors, Mueller Systems out of Woodstock, Ontario. Coming back to uh, Dr. Jeremy Friedberg, uh, it's been a fascinating discussion uh, so far, but I'm sure, actually, before I get to the question I wanted to ask you, I have another question. This is not science-related, but my background is, is full of entrepreneurial initiatives, and uh, I've started and, and sold off several companies over my career, and I'm curious on where you were the night that you, and I believe you had two other co-founders, and, and where you were when you were sitting and, and, and dreamt up the concept of Sponge Lab. Uh, where was that night, and uh, how did it all come together? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it was one of the uh, few domain names that was freely available to register at the time. But uh, the Sponge Lab was really, uh, as a name, um, was that our minds are sponges. And we're a lab because we, we focus on science. Content. That's what's that's what sort of uh, it, where it came from, and it it was it was probably number eleventh down the list of, of names that we had. But it just went just sitting around at a coffee one day, and it's like that's it, that's it. Is it is it available? Sure. Are the SpongeBob folks going to care? Um, no, nope, no, nope, they don't care. All right, we're good to go. So that's how it happened. You know, I often ask that story to different entrepreneurs, and uh, invariably the word coffee often enters into it. I think coffee houses across North America are famous for spawning new initiatives and new, uh, new endeavors, so that's always of interest to me. Anyways, um, of interest to you, what are your, some of your favorite projects and some of your favorite games uh, over there at SpongeLab? My, my favorite games. I, I have to say uh, transcription here was a lot of fun, and it was uh, an interesting game to build, and we've... We've had a lot of requests to take that game to the next level, and um, we have plans for Dance Dance Replication um, to uh, employ the uh, the DDR pad and bring some <laughs> physical e physical education back into this whole process here. So it was it was a really fun game to make. Um, in terms of stuff uh, that's out right now, the history of biology uh, is is a phenomenal game. 
Uh, and it's it's a difficult game to explain. I've started to talk about it a little bit, um, and you can go to um, WW uh, Sponge. Uh, well, you can see the trailer right there. Um, but this particular game is not only blends together both the the people, the discoveries and techniques, but it also was an attempt to take biology, chemistry, physics, um, political and social issues, and weld them together into one framework. And um, I think we did a really, uh, a really nice job of doing that because, you know, at the beginning there was no such thing as a biologist or a physicist. You were just a, 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 a scientist. And, you know, we had this, this fundamental partition of the, of the subjects, but they're all connected together. And it's, we're very proud of this game. And it took us a year and a half to write the, the backstory for this and to, and to vet all the content wow. in it. But it's, um, it, we're really quite proud of this. Um, in terms of what we've been building, uh, you, the game content itself is is only a small fraction of what we do, and in education there there are enormous challenges to actually bringing this stuff into classrooms. And so, one of the most basic questions is how do I take a gig and a half of content and stick it in a school computer on a meager internet connection with questionable hardware and software in that computer? And it took us about two hours to develop a delivery platform, uh, two hours, sorry, two years to deliver, uh, develop a delivery platform to actually just send content. And then once we figured that out, we had to develop the whole educational design around this. So there's the games, but then there's, well, what am I, what's the, st the, the pedagogy around it? Like, what am I doing on day one? How does it carry through? How do I blend in my wet labs and other things like that? And, and then how do I assess my students? And so we built a, a whole uh, assessment approach that called integrated game-based assessment, where this, the games themselves are providing unbelievable metrics. And we tie that to the integrated notebook, and you as, a, as an educator can see some amazing things happening. And in terms of data, it's, it's like being able to give your students a quiz a couple of times a day, every day for the entire semester, and then the system distills all that information down. So we look at engagement, you know, very fundamental questions. Are they using it? If I deploy a book, I don't know if they've opened it closed it, if they read the first page, there's a lot of, but I can see exactly what their engagement was the first day, how it's progressing, how it's changing, where they're engaging from, but also how they're performing in the, with the content themselves. And so their actual performance in the games, the time to reach certain milestones, and then through the notebook, we can actually see what they're thinking. And so I can see a chronological listing of, of what they're writing in their notebook. So I can see on the first time they played, they thought this, but the 10th time they thought this and watch the progression of their understanding or the fact they're talking about geography. They don't even know they're in a bio class, which is ultimately quite helpful. So it's, you know, it's all of that wrapped together. I mean, begin, it's, it's a massive piece of software that we've been building and continually building. We're really releasing a new platform in about, uh, in about a month and all of that, really together was, was a huge achievement for us because it really, there was no model for us to sort of work under and we were sort of experimenting as we go and things didn't work and we had to redesign and rebuild and it was, a, it was an enormous process and so we're a small team and, and it, it was a, a, a big, it was, I was very proud of my team for being able to develop what we've developed so far. Uh, you're, you're Oh, we lost Colin. Colin has uh, left the building, no matter. I had a question for you related to one of Thomas's uh, comments a few minutes sure. ago. He was talking about the speed at which, uh, you know, uh, not just technology, but uh, discoveries in the scientific community uh, seem to take place. What do you do at SpongeLab to make sure those, uh, that content is, is, is up to date as possible within your, um, within your programming? Um, we effectively, we never stop building. So we don't, we don't produce any, any solid media software anymore. We don't distribute CDs or anything like that. Everything is server-deployed server and right. uh, in a very dynamic way. So uh, we update stuff daily, and it, can, it seamlessly filters down to all our users, and we don't, it, the, the software continuously evolves. And so for those in the, in the software development com community, this concept of HTML5 and where things are evolving to, we have a, a strategic plan in how to slowly fold our content in and be compliant with the new, the new generation of browsers that are coming out. So it, yeah, it's I'm an sure endless process. It never stops. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's a huge job. Uh, good for you for keeping on top of it. Uh, Colin, I was about to go to you for a question when you, uh, you decided you had to go for uh, a coffee or something, but you're back now. So um, you want to jump in? Yeah.
Sorry, sorry about that. I just I didn't get a copy. I didn't have time. I was trying to reconnect. Um, I'm <laughs> sitting here thinking ab about like because you, you you mentioned the the uh, the assessment pieces where you can um, sort of follow a progress uh, you know through a semester or through a certain period of time for for teachers to see what students are actually doing. Yeah. Have you provided? And I've been digging on your website a bit, but not not a whole lot. So maybe the maybe the answer is there. Have you provided sort of ways of integrating long-term for teachers rather than just, you know, oh, here's today is sponge lab day and you go in and you play it, but have you provided some of that thinking around how to take your approach and integrate it over, say, a semester or, or a longer-term period of time for teachers to actually jump into and start to use this stuff? Yeah, yeah and so our first, uh, yeah, and, and if you go, if you go, if you go to the website, you'll see there's an admin, admin, uh, admin login. If you, when you have a teacher's account, you can log in there and get access to all the back end, the management tools and all the, all the right. resource tools. So yeah, we, we've scripted out ways of using this day to day in your classroom. And one of the things you'll know in our first product, Genomics Digital Lab, um, that, you know, that product has a really interesting history. It was originally started, some of the assets were started for a museum installation for Purdue University and built into a larger product after that. But through that process of going, and it's actually in version five right now of Genomics Digital Lab, um, it was about going from day to day, but also building four classrooms. And so the games within them, there are eight integrated games around the story of energy, but each game has a short direct gameplay, around 30 to 35 minutes per student per sitting, so that there is something that is functional and, and usable and tangible within this classroom period, which is generally around 50 or 75 minutes, depending on where you go. But teachers sure. function with it a day to day, these, these little packets of time with their students and we spent a lot of time designing those games to have a longer story that spans over different classes and also um, have something that's tangible um, and digestible within that actual classroom period. Likewise the history of biology game it's got it's something like 25 hours of gameplay in it but wow. you can deploy it the teachers can, can set a setting for their class where it deploys it weekly so you can play it over 14 weeks throughout your semester so you're dealing with the game in little chunks a little bit of time every week and giving students actual time to work through the missions so um, it yeah we, we, we've been experimenting with that and our, our new platform coming out is actually extends it even further to help develop the entire design of everything that you're doing in your classroom from the digital perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. The uh, the the history one was I was playing with that a little bit because it always strikes me as such a neat way to go through like thinking from a high school point of view the introductory type courses we do whether it's biology or chemistry or I used to do astronomy and physics, um, but you find yourself so often talking about things that happened in the past. Right? So coming at it from a historical point of view, looking at the science as they developed, as like in this case like a mystery, for example, is a really neat way to get them into the story, but also get them into the science with so, almost like with, with fresh eyes rather than, you know, oh, this is what happened 300 years ago. It puts them in the place, and so they're making the discoveries, which is really hard to do just flipping through a textbook. So it's a very, very interesting approach. And with that game, we, in terms of the story, then we structured it so that the end of the game ends in the very mm -hmm. near future within about a year to two years out from where we are right now. And so they'll cool. deal with things that are happening today, issues and, and, and ethics and politics that are mm. happening right now in and around the science. And then the game is going to take them to what is the next major revolution in science that's happening. It's going to happen very soon. I don't want to spoil it for everyone. But uh, ultimately <laughs> at the end of the game, they're going to have, there's three different endings to the game. They're going to have to make a choice of what to do ah. with this information. And so uh, it allows them to explore the science of where we're going to be in about two years, but also the choice, the ethics, and, and issues in and around them. Hmm. And yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. It is. It's, it's, it's important. It's important connection. Hmm. You guys aren't going to believe this, but we are almost out of time. Uh, last question to you, Dr. Merritt, sir. <laughs> Okay, I, and I, I've been itching to ask this question. We'll see if I have enough time for you to, to answer it. Um, can, can you give our teachers an idea of a way that they can apply what you've learned as an educator to the material that they're presenting? So obviously the best thing they can do, is, not the best thing, one they can do is go out and use your, your products. But in the years that you've been doing this, you've learned quite a bit about how you present material. Is there something you can tell our teachers about how they can take just general work in their classroom and apply what you've learned as an educator to make that material more approachable to their students? 
Uh, there, there's a lot of things I've tried over the years. Some which have totally failed. Some which is some which were some were great successes. But what I found really in keeps attention and it's really for me about engagement and it's doing whatever I can to engage my students is storytelling and I think storytelling has probably been is one of the oldest forms of communications around and we've been doing it forever and people love a good story and if whatever you're teaching you can dig up a story that helps them reconnect with the content it's it's really uh, it's really very useful um, but you know in when I when I taught I taught a, a second year applied applied bio, a cell biology class at, at Wilfrid Laurier, and with those students um, I, I wanted to explore the sort of the cultural and social aspects of the science that they were studying, and so the project was we're going to make a newspaper, and so we got help uh, publishing help from the campus paper, but students had to pick anything they want in in cell biology, figure out the the system, but then write it up so that they could communicate it to, to everybody else on campus. And so they were, they were looking at things like um, the effects of how does caffeine work or THC, how does THC affect the brain? I mean, it is topical, relevant stuff for, the, for that community, but also it's, raw, it's, core, it's real cell biology. I mean, why not talk about that? You know, there's no, we, it, it, use something that connects, that directly connects stories, topical events, they're all, they're all great things. Uh, as an example, in, in Genomics Digital Lab, one of the first case studies in that, that series, um, you know, deals with the energy crisis. But the, one of the games, the second game, deals with the light reactions in photosynthesis. But Photosystem 2 is absorbing light energy, and it's creating a burnable fuel, hydrogen gas, and electricity. And it's doing it at 98% efficiency. We have no technology on the planet that comes close to that. But they understand the energy crisis. But here's a little protein complex that's figured it out a long time ago, but it's figured it out. And it was published just a couple of months ago. The synthetic leaf is now being right. tested as a, you know, a new alternative for energy generation. So it's the stories and those, those real cultural and social connections, I think, is what I've found really works for me. But I like to talk, and I'll never stop talking, given the opportunity. So it, <laughs> it seems to work when I'm, when, when I'm in front of students. That, well, that's we, great. Uh, I think that's a great suggestion. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. We appreciate you talking today, too, by, uh, you know, just, just to mention that. It's been fantastic to listen to you and uh, to hear what you're doing over at Sponge Lab. So we actually have time for one more, <laughs> Colin Jago. <laughs> Um, well, you know what, let, let, let's take it back to, to where I am here. Um, with my high school teachers, what can they do to try these things out and to start to play with them and to get their students involved? Yeah. Um, you know what, uh, our, they can go to spongelab.com, they, um, they can try, there's a free trial that they can get access to the games and uh, just, just start there. Um, the thing is, there's a lot of great digital resources out there. I mean, I, I love our stuff. I'm, I'm a little biased, but there's a lot of great stuff out there. And I think, I think the, the real take-home message is that it takes a little bit of time to get yourself up and running. And mm -hmm. if you use the tools properly to their fullest and look at the idea of both the teaching and the metrics that it can provide you, you have some right. really powerful tools that, that will ultimately make you, what you're doing more meaningful and easier. Right. So, I mean, don't shy away from it. You know, it takes some time to get into it. But once you're there, you've got some really powerful tools at your disposal. And uh, it, it's just, uh, you, you got to jump in. <laughs> that's, a, yeah, that's a good message. That's a good way to put it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think that's a good way to close off the show. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Friedberg from Sponge Lab in Toronto. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks for taking the time to do it. Uh, just, just love what you're doing. Keep up the good Thank work. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Tuning into this week in science and education, this is your host Kevin Kugler, and on behalf of Dr. Thomas Merritt and Colin Jago, have a good week, everyone. We'll see you same time next week. Take care now. <laughs>